Okay, so the thing I was, this, this was a question that I've actually been asked a few times by people, particularly in America. Um, they contact me and they actually ask me, does Judaism have a spiritual path? Okay. And my response to that is, yes, of course. Yeah. And I was very unclear to start off with why they were asking this question. So I decided to go into it and look into it for myself. What is the problem with why we don't see that Judaism has a spiritual path? And when you look at other spiritual paths like Hinduism, Sufism, uh, Buddhism, of the different types of Buddhism that there are, people see very clearly that these are spiritual paths. And they don't ask the question, is Sufism a spiritual path? They don't ask the question, is, you know, does uh, Buddhism have a spiritual path? because they can see that it's got a spiritual path. So why are they asking this question about Judaism? So I really began to think about it. And the difference with Judaism and all the other isms that I've mentioned so far, and this might be a rather, you know, superficial approach, but I think it's true, is that to be spiritual and all the other paths, you have to cut yourself off to some extent or completely from the physical world. If you're a monk in the Buddhist tradition, you're a monk and you're supported by all the lay people who do all the, all the work of maintaining the world and you're a monk and you go into a hermitage or you go into a cave and you meditate. All right? If you're a Christian, for example, you go into a monastery, or if you're a woman, you're into a convent. Uh, in Sufism also, they separated from the world. But Judaism is different in that respect, that Judaism does not separate from the, from the, from the world. On the contrary, Judaism brings the spirituality and the physical world together. Not only that, but Judaism actually sees the physical as part of the spiritual world, all right? Now, in the about, this has always been true. This is not, this is not new. Anything I'm saying here is not new, okay? But I think that what happened was with the wave of rationalist thinking, and materialist thinking that swept over the West around the time of the beginning, the Industrial Revolution, and then all the philosophy, philosophy that came out of that, the material aspects of Judaism, in a sense, began to be more emphasized, particularly in Judaism from the West. It's not the case, by the way, in the Sephardi traditions. The Sephardi traditions have never lost their spirituality. They're completely integrated. They, they don't see the physical the, the, uh, or, or spiritual elements of, Ju of Judaism as separated. They see them completely as, as one. But in the West, we've sort of separated them so people tend to see Judaism either as a collection of ritual acts, which, you know, the religious Orthodox Jew does, or they see them as a collection of social customs, um, or a, a system of ethics, or what's called now tikkun olam. They're all here to rectify the world. Now, all these elements, of course, are found in Judaism, but it's also to be found 
a deep and profound spiritual path. Now, the deep and profound spiritual path is the Kabbalah, okay? And the Kabbalah is also a spiritual path which was never intended to function on its own, all right? It was always intended to function um, as a understanding of how the whole uh, religion actually functions. Now, what we're going to do today, we're going to um, look at um, some of this idea also in the texts, okay? The um, Rabbi Ashlag teaches us that the spiritual worlds are created one from another like an impression is created from a rubber stamp such that every element in a lower spiritual world has its corresponding component in a higher spiritual world. And actually the only difference between the worlds is the desires and, and material that each world is made up of. So in fact, our physical world may also be seen as an impression taken from the spiritual world above it. Thus, everything that exists within the physical world, whether we discern it by our senses or even we create it by imagination, has its root within the higher spiritual worlds. So in fact, every element of this physical world is a branch that stems from its specific root in the higher spiritual world. So we've got this intimate connection of sort of vertical connection, if you like, with the root and branches, which exists, all right, in, in the, in everything in the physical world actually comes from the spiritual worlds and therefore then they're, they're not separate at all and this relationship is actually what's described in the Kabbalah so let's take a few examples to see how this how this functions all right when we do a mitzvah for example when we shake the lulav all right, which is the four species, you've got the lulav, you've got the esrog, the willow and the myrtle, they're definitely physical, all right, so you can't shake an imaginary lulav, you actually have to take them and you can feel the lulav, you can smell the etrog, you can, you know, you, you, you smell the myrtle, the willow doesn't smell at all, but you take the whole thing, you bind it together and you shake them physically, you know, this way, that way, up, down, right, okay, what are we doing? We're taking four elements in the physical world and actually the Zohar tells us how we make an effect in the higher spiritual worlds. And the Zohar actually teaches us that by doing that, we're actually causing a tremendous unification of God's name in the world. Because the lulav, the etrog, the willow and the myrtle all stand for the different letters of God's name. When we bring them together, and we shake them in the different directions, we're actually causing a unification of God's name. Now, the, we might not be able to feel that. It depends, you know, if you're a great tzaddik, a great sage or something, then you can actually feel and experience this energy, if you like, this spiritual energy. We don't, we may or may not Okay, it depends. Sometimes we get a gift from God and he actually does give us this, you know, this woo, this wow, this, you know, amazing uh, uh, response. Uh, but sometimes we don't. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. We do it and we do it with faith that it's happening. So when we make a mitzvah in this world, it actually causes profound effects in the world, you know, uh, above us. It's just, you know, phenomenal. All right. 
Now, when that has, when it has that effect, then the light, we, we're causing an effect, we're causing something to happen in the higher spiritual worlds, and then those spiritual worlds respond, okay? And they bring the light, bring the blessing back down into the world, okay? And it all flows. So what we find is that the spiritual role, the spirituality of Judaism and the physicality, the physical world of Judaism are totally integrated, all right? Now, I think that's actually been the issue that people have been looking at parts of Judaism and not looking at Judaism as a whole. And I think this is one of the most important rectifications of Judaism, one of the most important tikkunim of Judaism that we're going to see in the um, modern age now, in this, this age now, when the Jews are back in their land, we're going to find that all the components of Judaism are going to come back and reunify. All right? Everybody okay with all of that? Is there any, oh, there's a chat there, what does that say? Oh, David, beautiful, the entire world is filled with his glory, beautiful, absolutely, 100%. That's right, it really is. You know, when we look at our, uh, you know, the, the physical bodies, you know, in so many of the uh, other religions, the physical body is also, um, you know, it's, put its limits, you've got asceticism, but what we have in Judaism is so much, you know, a celebration also, you know, keeping our health is important and celebrating the, with the, 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 the festivals and Shabbat physically with, with Kiddush, with, the, with the beautiful meals, um, with song, with dance. We, it, it's, it really is an integrated experience. Now, I actually thought about how can we look at this more deeply. So I've got here, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, now where is it? I think it's, I think it's there. I think that's the thing I need. That's not the bit I need, sorry, but it will come, it will come. Yes. Now, the first piece I want to share is this. Where are we? Where's the view? Oh, there, view, make it bigger. All right, can you see that okay? Hopefully. Um, the physical practice of Judaism is called the halakha, all right? The halakha is the, is the rules. How do we do things? Okay? So we start off with the Torah, the, the five books of Moses, and you get a told that there, you, there is a mitzvah, you need to do this or you need to do that. And the one we're going to be looking at today is the mitzvah, and, you, and when you eat and you should be satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God, which is from this week's uh, Sidra, Akev. All right? And the how to bless or how to do something is called halakha and all the details of actually how to do something is listed for us in the codes which are based on the Mishnah and the Talmud. Now the sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud definitely knew Kabbalah. There's no question about that. Rabbi Ashlag teaches us that they, they, they were great uh, 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 Kabbalists, all of them. Not all of them had the um, permission from God to teach it out, to teach it, to bring it forth. Rabbi Sh Shimon Bar Yochai, the great Kabbalist who's buried not far from Tzfat and Meiron and who brought down the Zohar, he was one of the great um, uh, uh, sages of the Mishnah. And he was the one who taught the Kabbalah. 
But it doesn't mean to say that the others did not. They certainly did, but they didn't necessarily teach it. They, they, when they looked at halakha, they were discussing the halakha, they were all looking at it from its spiritual roots. Okay? And they more or less fix the halakha, how we do something. So how we do something and what words we say or how we do it, which is, which is all contained in halakha, is also based on the spiritual roots, which we learn in Kabbalah. Now, Rabbi Chaim Vital was a great pupil of the Holy Ari. The Holy Ari, also a Kabbalist from Tzfat. And he taught Rabbi Chaim Vital, not far from where I'm sitting, down in the old city, very close to where Meir is. Okay, he lived not, sitting there and lived not. Um, he, he said like this, one should not say, I will go and practice Kabbalah before I practice the Torah of the Mishnah and Talmud, which is the Halakha. For the rabbis have already taught that a person should not study Kabbalah if he has not already filled his belly with Mishnah and Talmud. This would be like a soul without a body, lacking any contact with this physical world. And a person is not fully incarnate until he becomes involved at the physical level with the mitzvot of the Torah. In other words, you've got to do the actuality as well, all right, to the best of our ability to, in, in our particular circumstances. I'm not saying right now that everybody's got to go out and fulfill all 613 mitzvot of the Torah. That, is, that would not be realistic. We've got to start with where we are. But a lot of the mitzvot, a lot of the halakha, also deals with our ethical interactions, our relationships between one and, the, and another. Those are also just looked at in halakha, and there is rules about how we need to relate to each other. For example, the rules of Loshon Hara. These are daf there's a lot of halakha on that, what you're allowed to say. Uh, that's, sorry, that's good speech not speaking badly about somebody else. There's a lot of, a tremendous body of halakha of actually how to speak, what you're allowed to say about somebody else and what you're not allowed to say about somebody else. So those um, people who are, not, uh, 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 who are not religious and are living more secular lives could certainly start using halakha on that basis, going into the, the um, relationships between man and his fellow man and and his fellow human being or woman and her fellow human being i'm getting very gender uh, aware these days um would actually can certainly start with those uh, a mitzvot all right because they're mitzvot between man and god and there's a mitzvot between man and one's fellow human being so he said a person is not fully incarnate until he becomes involved at the physical level with the mitzvot of the Torah. But the opposite is also true. If, and this is what has happened, you see, around about the 19th century, particularly in, in the European Jews, if somebody studies halakha, Mishnah and Talmud, without also spending time in studying the innermost aspects of Torah and its secrets, which is how to love God, how to have reverence for God, how to feel, how to have intention, how to connect, okay? All this comes through the Kabbalah without also spending time in studying the innermost aspects of Torah and its secrets. He's like a body sitting in darkness, lacking a human soul, which is the light of God that shines within. And the body becomes dry because it's not taking from the Torah, the source of its life, okay? And so the Kabbalah actually gives us the life, okay? The, the impetus, the desire, all right? And that's why we absolutely have to see Judaism as a whole spiritual path, combining all aspects together, rather than a spiritual path which is or rather than, you know, one aspect or another aspect or another aspect 
um, and finding it doesn't really satisfy. Okay? And I really feel that this is what's actually happened to a large extent in America, that the different sections of the community are all doing different aspects, but they're not doing all them as a whole. And I absolutely are referring to the Haredi community, the Orthodox community in America, just as much as I'm talking about the Reform and the Conservative. None of them are doing whole Judaism. All right? Only when you combine it in this unique, beautiful way do you actually get a whole Judaism. And this is what I find is so beautiful about the, the Judaism as it's coming now in the land of Israel. Okay, right. But it's Rosh Hashem. Um, this is going, this is where we're going to uh, do. Now, what I'd like to do today to actually illustrate what I've been talking about is to take one aspect, which is actually in this week's parasha, and look and see how it functions. Somebody's on the chat. Uh, I saw a chat and now it's lost it. I have lost it. I have a question. Oh, David, was it you? Yes, I just wrote that I have a question. That's all. Okay, right. Okay, so yeah, good. It's much easier when you say something because I can't find this chat thing. Right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. I just didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, okay, good. So we established that, well, I, I don't know if I'm coloring it at all what you said, but essentially that there's no separation between the physical acts in Judaism and the spiritual as part of one whole picture. It's like yes. it's, they're one and the same. Yeah. So like, like say you take like a real, somebody who really studies a lot of, of Gemara and Halacha, um, they are in a sense still studying the same Judaism as like what we're studying right now. They're still studying Ju Judaism, which is one and the same with the Kabbalah. So I think that even though, um, it can definitely become very dry. It's it's still, if you have that awareness, looking into it, that what you're studying is still one and the same, even just having that awareness in and of itself, kind of like opens up, can open up your, your frame of mind and looking at it in a new way that, wow, this is the same, this is part of the spiritual path and this is like part of the spiritual practice. Sorry, that wasn't really a question. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's a question, but yeah, yeah. those are my thoughts. Okay, first of all, yes, all right, absolutely yes. Now. You're right, how you study it. Now, being a woman, you know, I never really got to study uh, Talmud that much. Um, nowadays, the women learn Talmud, you know, uh, it, it, you can find women learning Talmud easily, but not when I was younger. Um, and um, you're right, the question is how you do it, all right? Now, in the past, and I, I, you know, to many places still, they learn, they learn uh, Gemara as an intellectual discussion, you know, or they're not looking to see what are the spiritual roots. And one of, the, I think, the most amazing things that I love so much about Rabbi Ashlag is when you go deeply into his material, quite often, he'll explain a piece of Gomorrah and you suddenly see the spiritual roots there and you're like blown away, absolutely blown away. And then you see that something that you thought was just, you know, some rule or the other turned out to have tremendous spiritual implications. So it's, you do, you need, you need both, but you know, obviously we are who we are. We have our lives to lead. So we can't necessarily spend, you know, as much time as we want. But nevertheless, but if we look at one example, all right, I think we'll, we'll get to see a little bit of what I'm talking about today. But yeah, you're right. Now then, I need to, what do I need to do here? Get rid of that. No, what's that doing? Stop share. Okay, that's good. I've stopped share. 
now I need to share screen again um, why can't I find oh I see I made a mistake hold on I think I switched off what I actually wanted sorry I should take me a second yeah I'm sorry I I actually closed the window I was looking for I apologize everybody one day no need to apologize <laughs> one day I will get this zoom thing down pat um, Jewish practice that's the one I wanted and this is the one I wanted right There we go. That's the one I'm looking for. Now, you probably can't see anything. I need to do share screen now. That's the one we need. Share. Okay, got it. Hooray. All right, can you see? All right, this is from the Chabad website. All right, and you've got all these different foods. All right, and we have here the blessings to be said for every different food. Um, if you go back one, okay, it says like this. Before a Jew eats or drinks, he or she recites a blessing called a bracha, praising and thanking the Creator. Each category of foods has its unique blessing based on the provenance of the food and its position in Jewish tradition. There's also an after blessing, okay, and you will eat and you'll be satisfied, says the Torah, and you will bless the Lord your God for the good and expansive land which he gave you. All right, so the Torah says you shall eat and you'll be satisfied and you will bless. So the Torah tells us to eat and be satisfied and bless, okay? That's what we need to do. It's from that Torah saying that we get the brachot, that we get the blessings, that we get the requirement to bless. Then we go to how to say the blessing for each of the different foods, and we're not going to go into that right now. And then there's the blessing after meals, grace after meals. Okay, so that's the aspect of the physical, of the halacha, we've been given some food, we take the food before we put it in our mouths, we make a blessing. And when we finished, we make a blessing after we finished. That's the practice, okay? The halacha. Now we're going to have a look at the Zohar, all right? And see what the spiritual root of that actually is. Okay. Is that the right one? Yes. Ma'amal kavanat habacha. That's it. I've got it. Oh, I, oh, wait a minute. I have to do, I have to do stop share and do start share again. That is this one. All right. Okay. All right. Let me get rid of that and make that small. Can you see okay? Yeah. If you can't, yeah, I can see it. Call out. Yeah. Is that all right? Good to go. Uh, all right, so here we've got at the top of the page, I'll just show you the page a little better. I zoom out a little bit. There you go. At the top of the page, we've got a piece of Zohar. All right. And then underneath, we've got um, the, the uh, explanation of Rabbi Ashlag in the called the Sulam. Okay, right, so let's begin. Vaya e keptishm un etamishpatim haele vagome. And it was when you hear these rules, etc. Vachalta, vasavata, uveirachta et hashem lokecha. And you shall eat, and you shall be satisfied, and you shall bless 
the Lord your God. Pikuda da leva chale le kutchebuchu al kol mata achil vashati vitane bahai olma. The loboich ikwe gazlan le gabe kutchebuchu, dirtib gozel avivi imo, vauk muha havaya, begin de birchan de barich bar nash le kutchebuchu, atil am shacha hain mi makor de haye lishme. The Kutcha Bricho Kadisha, Ola Alka Ale Mahu Mishcha Ila, Vatil at Mashcha Mataman the Kol Om Onma. Vachalta Vasavata Vivata et Hashem Lokeha, and you shall eat, and you shall be satisfied, and you shall bless the Lord your God. Okay, so that's the actual words in this week's parasha. And then it goes on to say, This commandment is to bless the Holy Blessed One for everything that a person eats and drinks and enjoys in this world. And if he doesn't bless, he's considered as somebody who's robbing God. As it's written, he's robbing his father and his mother. Okay? What does that mean? We're going to find out in a minute. And the companions established, as the sages said, that robbing his father and his mother actually relates to the Holy Blessed One. And Rabbi Ashak teaches that Aviv relates to the Holy Blessed One in the level of Zerampin and the mother in the level of the Shekhinah. So in other words, we've got the aspect of HaKadosh Baruch the Holy Blessed One. And we've got the aspect of the inner soul within us, which is the Shekhinah. So those, we, we are the blessing, of course God is not robbed by anybody. But the blessing means that we're giving something to God as, 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 the, as the transcendent, as the Holy Blessed One. And to the soul within. The blessing makes a difference. Okay? It makes a difference in the higher worlds. All right? Just as we looked at earlier, that the physical world and the spiritual worlds are intimately connected. So when we make the blessing, when we say words of blessing, we're actually um, uh, uh, causing a change. In the worlds. Now, why would we be considered as robbing? Well, if we were just to, if we were to eat, okay, without making a blessing, then what we're doing is we're actually like simply fulfilling our appetites, okay, in the same way that an animal does. All right, that's, it's okay for an animal to do that. That's what they're meant to do. But God put us on earth with a precise function. And the function of the human being on earth is to recognize the divine and to acknowledge the divine. Okay, so he gave us the animal body so we'd be, have those animal functions. But the purpose of it is to raise that up and connect it with the divine. Now, only the human being can do that. The animal can simply act as an animal. That's what he's meant to do. But the human being actually should be using his body in order to do this connection of the divine and the physical together. That's his role. That's the human being's role. And if we're not doing that, then it's as if we're robbing we're, 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 we're misusing our function so that the light which should come to the spiritual world so to, to, to through through us to the spirituality is actually uh, not going there all right so that is described as robbing but can you see it's kind of like 
the light is not going in its proper place when we eat ungratefully all right by Mishum, why is this? Mishum shabrachot shadam avarechet hakodesh bochu baim lim lamshi chayim mimakor hachayim. Because the blessings which a person blesses the holy blessed one have a purpose, and they are to draw life to all life force connection, the connection with the source of our life, from the source of our life, which is. Bina. Lishma Kadosh la Kadosh Bokhu to God's holy name. Ula Rikalav Mirtoshem and Aelion and to pour to God from the highest light. Shu Shefa Hachma, which is the bounty of the light of God. Hochma here is the light of God. Okay. Misha Misham Balai Mashek Bakolam. And from that highest, that highest bounty, it comes to all the world. So, this is actually true of every mitzvah that we do. Here we're just looking at one particular mitzvah, which is the mitzvah of making a blessing. But in fact, all the mitzvot, like we looked at, for example, the mitzvah of the lulav and and uh, the etrog, this is the way they work, okay? We say the words, the words go up, and through our words we are acknowledging God within, God without, God as the master of the universe, and our acknowledgement and that connection of the physical with the divine brings the light down in a proper way, which does not happen when we simply take, okay? When we take for ourselves alone, we're actually giving the light to what's called the framework of uncleanness, the framework of, of, of evil. We're causing the ego aspects of ourselves to swell okay and the source of life he says is the Svira of Bina Bina is a beautiful Svira Bina is the Svira of compassion okay Bina is the Svira which is ki olam chesed ibane the world will be built on loving kindness so when we make a blessing we bringing life from the source of loving kindness. All right? So far, so good? Any questions? No, I'm with you. You're with me. Great. Lovely. Okay, so let's move on then. Uchativ Vaachalta Vasavata Ubirachta et a shemlo keha Vinun birchan a rik barnash be inun milin mehuma koa ilaa Vit barchan kol inun dogin makorin Vit malian la alkal kol almin Vit barchan kol ho kahada And it's written, and you shall eat, and you shall be satisfied, and you shall bless the Lord your God. And it is with these, and in these blessings, a person pours out with these words, bounty from the highest source, which is Bina, which is the source of loving kindness and compassion into the world. And all the spiritual levels and the sources of the Zerampin and the Malchut, which we've said that are closest aspects of God to us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the Shekhinah, are filled up with the bounty and they pour out this light to all the worlds 
and all are blessed together. I mean, just, you know, isn't that amazing? You know, when I was a kid, and you know, at school, and Hebrew classes, um, I wasn't taught any of this. I was taught we have to make a blessing. I was taught the halakha, okay? I grew up in an Orthodox home in London, and I was taught that before you eat, you have to make a blessing. I was taught the words, okay? And uh, kind of like a, t a, a parrot or something, you have to say these words and then you can eat. And when you finish, you say these words and then you're finished. Okay? But nobody ever taught me why. And it's the joining of the halakha with the Kabbalah that I find so exciting. All right? If you like, for example, if you take Pesach, all right, let's just. Um, do the stop share for a second. And let's say if you take Pesach, okay? All right? So what do you do? You take that, you know, a matzah, okay? You've got this matzah on Pesach. And basically, what is it? It's a, it's a, a flat, a large cracker, all right? Made of flour and water. <laughs> it's kind of, you know. And so you eat a flat cracker. What's it doing? It's actually tr making a tremendous connection between the light of faith and ourselves. We're bringing the light of faith into the world by eating the matzah on Pesach. And what we do when we learn the Kabbalah is we learn what these connections are, why we're doing it. And this is called the Ta'amei Mitzvot, the reasons for the mitzvot. And in this day and age, when people are no longer happy to just do the halakha because that's the way you do it, and we, we need to bring this, these reasons in so that we understand why and we make this total unification, and then you see Judaism really is, or I think, honestly, the most complete spiritual path possible. All right. Now, of course, in order to um, understand the blessings properly, we also need to understand what these words mean. Um, now, it is here somewhere, but I think what we'll do is we'll just keep moving on in, in the right order if I start zooming around that won't work so okay we'll just move on gradually Mitaman it pashat bakol olma. Vaal derch tsrich adam la al ken tsrich adam la sum ut so no besoda bachot. Therefore, a person needs to put his will in the bachot, his desire. Okay? He wants to, he wants to eat. Not so much for the food, but because he gets to say the bracha. He gets to say the blessing. All right? Now, that's another thing, isn't it? There are many ways that the, that uh, particularly the Sephardim actually look at the blessings in this way. When, um, if you go to uh, a shiva 
house um, at in a Svati house okay they always pass around lots of trays of different foods nuts and seeds and uh, cookies and uh, fruit olives or something all right lots of different foods get passed around and the, and the tray goes round and round and round why does the tray go round because each time they make a blessing on that particular food in the name of the person who passed away so they're giving him all the credit for the blessing that they're making and this is what it says that a person needs to put his his desire into the blessings okay the blessings have power there's a very beautiful story well eventually it's beautiful um uh, it happened in Eretz Israel at the turn of the century at the time when the Turks were masters in the land okay before the British had got here and they were quite cruel um, and one time there was, there was bandits around and you know uh, uh, it, it, it was a it was quite chaotic and there was a, a, a sage I'm sorry I've forgotten who it was um, at the time I can sort of visualize it in my mind but I can't remember his name and he was traveling accompanied with two of his students and um, suddenly their little band got uh, attacked by these bandits um, and uh, they were going to be killed because these bandits wanted to take their horses or they wanted to take their money or something so um, the two students ran away and hid they managed to get away but the the rabbi didn't he got caught so the bandit says okay you know this is your last five minutes i'm going to kill you do you want anything like he's, he's teasing him you know he's playing with him so uh, the rabbi said uh, yes i'd like a glass of water please so <laughs> a glass of water so so uh he gives he, he he gives him a glass of water and what does the rabbi do of course he makes the blessing what does that blessing actually mean that everything happens according to his word at that moment some other the rival band of the bandits turns up and a fight breaks out between the two rival chiefs and in the balagan in the in the in the confusion the sage manages to slip away and join up with his two students and afterwards they said to him but rabbi we don't understand what did you ask for a glass of water for you needed water and he said don't be silly i didn't need the water i needed the blessing he knew the power of the words of the blessing. The one we make, the, the blessing that we make on um, practically everything that doesn't fall into a particular category, here we are. The blessing on all other foods is called Shehakol. That everything happens according to his word. Okay, and that's the blessing you make on water so he used that blessing all right knowing the power of the blessing all right and so it says here and the blessing actually brings down light to all the svirot chesed and and yesod all of them together and whoever blesses the Holy Blessed One, Mit Barech, is blessed in his turn and takes his portion from the blessings. First, for the whole world, 
uh, and then brings it down so he brings it through what that means is he goes through all the worlds one by one all the spiritual worlds until it comes down to this world and it goes on to say since God's name is blessed by that person the first portion of the blessings comes and lies on the head of the one who's doing the blessing and from there it spreads out and this is from the scripture in every kol makom asher skit shemi avo elecha ubrachticha every place where I mention my name I will come to you and I will bless you and once that blessing has come and inspired the person, the one who's blessing, then it spreads out from there to the whole world. All right? Beautiful, hey? We've got five more minutes. Very beautiful. I think it's an amazing idea. I really do. I mean, like, you know, this whole idea of the intimate connections. I'm, I'm just like, you know, but, and, it, and you see, the more you learn, the more you see this with every single mitzvah. That the light, the work that we do doesn't get lost. It doesn't matter that we can't feel it until we're at a stage at a spiritual high level we may not be able to feel it but don't ever imagine for, for uh, that it gets lost not at all whatever we manage to do goes up goes up and affects that that level one minute let me just um stop showing for a moment how do i do this all i've been seeing is you for a while Oh, my gosh, really? Oh, no. Yeah, but just, just at the Hebrew parts, it was okay. I'm so sorry. No, just I like the last time. Want, some people want to see the Hebrew, and I, I, I can't actually um, see what you guys can see. It, it, Zoom is very peculiar like this. On Skype, you can. On Zoom, you can't. It was only once or twice. It was no big deal. Sorry. No, it's okay. Okay. All right. So... Um, what I wanted to say was um, it goes up kind of in levels like we're on the let's say on the lowest level when they actually belong to the uh, world of Asiya okay and when we make a blessing it goes up inside the world of Asiya to all the four levels inside the world of Asiya and then it goes up the angels take it and bless it and it goes up to the next level and then to the next level and then to the next level and to the next level. Now, if our consciousness, our level of consciousness only reaches up to a certain level, never mind. We learn from the Kabbalah that it goes up all the way, right up to the throne of God. And then the blessing comes back down. And the Zohar tells that these two, sort of the blessing going up and the blessing coming down, meet and kiss and give to each other. So, you know, when you do a good deed, when you do it to uh, each other, when you, when you do to another human being, when you, when you give of yourself to God, don't ever imagine nothing's happening. In fact, Rabbi Ashak says the opposite. He says you cannot possibly know how much effect you're having. You cannot possibly know what a great effect we have, especially when we do something with all our heart. Okay? If we do something, you know, just the words, I'm not saying it does nothing, but it's a bit feeble. Okay? When you put a little bit of oomph there, you know, it goes higher. And when you do it with all your heart, it goes right up to the top. Okay? Now, 
we're human beings so we don't always manage it with all our heart but we can aim for that all right and the more we try the more the, the 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 more we can do it so let's just finish off with one more piece of the zohar mm? uh, do you want us to be able to see it oh i forgot thank you yes why not share screen Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, you see, after having figured out that I don't know how to do it, I don't I see it now. It. <laughs> All right. You're not alone. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Kat salkin inun birchin metata. This is how the bachas, the blessings go up from below. Lit pitcha pitcha le eila, velit mi mena le eila, de lo petach kol inun pitchin. Mikraze va amib kol inun wiki in. Da ihu dorona de marka de chadea poloni. Da hu dorona bikiuma de katakaya ut. Uman ihu boachad it ivu ale amen. The call Bahad Itivale Amen, that you be Kyoma Kadakaya Ot. When the, these blessings go up from below, uh, where I've lost the place, sorry. Oh, here we are. There is an, a, an angel pointed from above. And he makes a decree and he says regarding all these uh, levels that this is a gift to the king that the person sent that it says by his name which person it was who sent and then it's a gift in its fullness as is fitting what is a gift when a blessing is in its is in its fullness when somebody else has answered on it amen because it's like the word amen is yes all right it's like you're saying yes so, so let's say you're together with your friend okay or and somebody's there eating something and he makes the blessing and you hear the blessing you say amen what is the word amen it means assuredly of course yes so the other person is actually helping that blessing to go up all right so we help each other so if somebody makes a blessing and their companion says amen that gives the blessing even more power than when we do it on our own of course if you're on your own if you're living on your own then you do what you can but if you're together with somebody else and you hear somebody else make the blessing and that person says amen then that amen crowns the blessing with even more light all right i think that's a nice note to finish on <laughs> <laughs>